handing this over to Martin Daugoulis, whom I've seen somewhere. I think <laughs> I've seen you somewhere. I'm not sure where. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, you're supposed to lead the panel discussion now, which is, um, and uh, it's 30 minutes at your disposal. Uh, and I'll, I'll be back once, uh, once you run out of time. But uh, uh, Manish, please. This famous quote, I'll be back. Uh, <laughs> I will be back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Eddie, very much. Uh, we are taking over this wonderful baseline of uh, this information was given in the previous talk, and uh, we are taking this over with a panel discussion on this information and overcoming it in the, first, the 21st century with all its challenges that we have today. And I'm absolutely happy to have here in the studio um, Elina Lange, Jonathan Mishvili, uh, from the uh, senior expert, NATO strate Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. Hello. Hello. Good ha to be here. <laughs> Good to be here. And Mr. Janis Rungulis, Strategic Communications European External Action Service. Janis, uh, do you hear us and happy to see you? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The first question is, you heard the previous discussion. And uh, from your perspective, because you are strategic communicators and experts and analyzers of this stuff, why we should be careful when we speak about disinformation and from your perspective what characterizes this information what is it really from scientific perspective that would be the question elena we're going to start with you okay thank you martin um so i think uh, the first uh, nuance that probably we have to address is the difference between disinformation and misinformation uh, which often we don't actually pay attention to when we use the language on a daily basis. But there is a very big difference because misinformation uh, is about somebody spreading incorrect or false information without a malicious intent. So without realizing it and without actually uh, intending to do any harm. So easy to remember, misinformation, the word mistake, so genuine mistake. Uh, then we have disinformation, uh, which has a malicious intent uh, behind it. Uh, so the um, and this is the problem because uh, actually maybe the the kind of the other part of the word uh, information is a little bit misleading because we think oh so we just spread some information and you know who cares uh, no harm done but the the point is that with this malicious intent you know to inform is to influence and that's the whole point we want to influence those I mean not we but <laughs> those who spread this information they want to influence people's behavior so this disinformation is oriented towards you know either making somebody vote in a certain way in an election or quite the opposite not to vote uh, or actually you know uh, wear face masks uh, during COVID pandemic or not wear face masks so uh, it's all about influencing other people's behavior and this is what can become danger not just to particular individuals who fall for it but for the entire society or for national security so I would say this is the the, the main difference and characteristic okay uh, taking over that uh, from European external action service perspective what is the frame the framework how you see this information and what's behind that uh, Martin, uh, before I jump in there, uh, can I ask you to be my eyes for for ten seconds and tell me what I mean? How I mean? What is the audience? What they look like? I want to know to whom I'm talking to. You are talking to wonderful people who are watching us online. So the icebreakers are online, and there are hundreds of people watching us at this particular moment. Students, also university staff, all interested persons, and here on the place we have wonderful technicians couple cameras <laughs> screens and all good people all good crowd thank you thank you for giving me this view of what's happening there <laughs> so uh let me give you a view from uh, i mean i would actually make a broader view and like uh, i would like to make it a bit more personal uh, but this information so uh first is uh, elena elena gave really good overview of definition i think there's nothing much to add on this yes there is mis and disinformation and and what my team is doing, I mean, we, I am working in the team, the EU, which the info, we have a website and, and uh, we have database. So we look on this disinformation, especially from pro-Kremlin sources. But now we'll take a, bit, a small step back and I will tell you how I see this information. Um, so uh, my background is uh, is in advertising and, and public relations and communication in general. And when I joined uh, this team, I suddenly realized that actually what we're dealing with is we're dealing with uh, largely with information campaigns. So we're dealing with information campaigns uh, being carried out 
from my teacher's perspective, from pro Kremlin, from pro Kremlin media, and targeting us. And and uh, when it comes to the problems of it, why it's problematic and how to address this. Uh, first point is, I mean, it's about democracy. So uh, democracies, as we know them, they function on uh, debate. So we have to be able to talk about things, the hard things in, in uh, difficult topics in societies and agree how to deal with them. And this is, has to be part of, because this is what societies are for. But the problem is, if you have external external actor, like uh, like external country who comes in and... and uh, and tries to influence these these discussions, and actually they would try to divide societies and spread fear in them. That becomes a big problem. So uh, I think that that's the next question we'll discuss. Basically, I think we if we also need to address them as as uh, information campaigns targeting us. So, but I think that's next, right? Yeah, absolutely right. The question is, uh, if we have this baseline, then, uh, well, debate is deformed, so democracy is under the threat. The question is how to get this debate, the truth, back on track in this age when information is so fragmented and so intense. Elena. Yeah, I think, well, continuing uh, Jan's thought about uh, democracy, I mean, the cornerstone of a democracy is a uh, fair and free election, right? And I think this uh, disinformation is trying to target uh, all aspects of election. So we should not be uh, paying attention only to the public debate uh, that is happening, because that is the kind of obvious part. We see what is being said, written, posted on social media. Uh, but I think it's also about trying to target election as a process. So uh, our belief uh, that the election was actually free and fair, that it was not influenced uh, by, by outside uh, sources, also any kind of attempts to disinform people so that they get confused and they don't know. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, um, uh, in the previous election, we saw that people were told, oh, you can vote by phone, just send a text message. And, you know, some of you may think, well, this is silly. But then again, there were plenty of people who fell for it. So it is about, yes, attacking democracy and particularly election from all these different sides. And I think what is important is uh, what Janis also mentioned that this disinformation, it just doesn't happen in a day. So it takes a long time. It's kind of building up. So we have to be aware all the time. We can't just focus, oh, now election is coming up. Let's now focus and try to catch these disinformation cases. Disinformation doesn't work if there is not already enough base in the mm -hmm. society, ena in enough uh, breakage of trust or doubt uh, or dissatisfaction. So this is how it works, that it's being built up gradually. And this is a problem that governments still haven't solved. And I'm turning Turning to you, uh, dear young innovators, this is the one million dollar question. If you can come up with a solution that would help governments uh, and civic society and media to uh, detect this information as it appears and analyze the trends, I think now the problem is that we are a lot of the time acting too late. So we are kind of two steps behind. We notice the disinformation when it's already out there and it's already doing the harm. But who can come up? Uh, with a way of how we could predict and prevent and detect it early enough before it causes karma, uh, harm. I think this is the question. So a question about prevention before the uh, this disinformation spreads around. Yanis, um, uh, from the Europe's perspective, uh, we are all the time talking about in the previous panel also, there was talks about United States of America and disinformation in United States of America, Donald Trump, etc. The question is, could you give a description of uh, Europe, how Europe looks from disinformation perspective? Well, uh, as I told you, uh, my team specializes in uh, in procurement disinformation. So what we do, uh, we actually monitor, um, we're monitoring disinformation in uh, 17 languages. So across the EU languages and also broader, broader perspective, Western Balkans, this partnership, so more. So I can, I can, what I can tell you briefly is how, I mean, uh, how EU looks, I mean, how Europe looks from, from this in perspective. But uh, before I go there, I, I have to warn you, this is disinformation. So what I can tell you, I will say disinformation. But first, it's so uh, briefly, so uh, disinformation as a communication campaign, it's actually is, is similar to the campaigns that, that banks run or mobile operators run from the perspective that has audiences, it has messages, and it has channels how we reach 
how, how it reaches people. So what's important is that uh, these mission campaigns are also uh, systematic so and they're repetitive as they're all the good communication is it repeats itself so that's why so there is the, so uh, so i would structure messages about europe in the two big blocks so one one block is the rep, uh, the the usual ones the usual suspects that keep repeating for example i mean i can tell you now that uh, eu is 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 weak that uh, that basically uh, eu is fragmented that uh, Western powers can't really govern themselves. And then you, for example, this big narrative about that is weak and suffering, you add up their messages uh, depending on situation. For example, you can say, if there's migration crisis, say, oh, for example, you see how they deal with migration crisis. They can't deal with this if COVID happens. Oh, you see, they can't deal with COVID. So basically, so you have these big narratives that, that uh, it's not functioning, and then you have the small narratives being fed in on top of it. So one big narrative is that basically that uh, it's not functioning. Uh, second big narrative is that uh, that EU and so what's important is it's not about Europe only it's about the big Western powers they're meddling they're meddling in affairs so then you have example of NATO NATO expanded not the expansion but its aggression towards towards Russia right then you have this and then you have all the meddling in 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 elections that and uh, elections and also the, all the protests so you can find uh, from Brock Kremlin's perspective that that. Uh, that West has been you know, behind uh, Maidan, has, is behind now uh, Belarus, is even now, for example, you know, in Kyrgyzstan, people are in the streets. It's even there behind. So these these narratives being spread. And then the big block, or you heard from previous speaker, Lisa, we heard about uh, COVID. It's also there. But I'm telling you again, and this is, this is this information. And if you see it, hear it, uh, search about this, check it. Don't share this further. Thank you. Okay, Yanis already touched the level of personal responsibility. So we have state responsibility, Europe's responsibility. About personal responsibility, what is the digital hygiene that you recommend for the people to avoid disinformation, becoming victim of disinformation? Yeah, I think uh, that people just should uh, become less uh, lazy because this is the human nature. <laughs> and of course, we blame it on, uh, you know, this uh, very fast uh, information environment that we live in and we are swamped with news and we manage to read just the headlines and we must orientate ourselves. Uh, in this deluge of information, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's 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 not quite as bad. And I I, I strongly believe that we still all have time uh, to actually check the sources and do all this ABC that has been talked about a lot uh, in the past uh, couple of years. So I won't repeat that. But um, I will uh, maybe point out uh, another issue, which, I, which is also linked to uh, human nature. So now this uh, legacy or, or traditional media is uh, largely replaced by social networks. And uh, the issue there is that uh, if when we watch TV or read a newspaper, we understood that there is this editor and, you know, journalist uh, uh, standing behind this information. So we understand, OK, they choose what to put there. And, and you know, so it's kind of their editorial policy on the social networks, such as, you know, uh, whatever Facebook. I understand that's old school network, but I'm still there. So <laughs> let's take Facebook, for example. So there it is about peer to peer trust. So I assume assume that you know these are my closest people my friends my family so they are telling me this and this is a completely different perception from a human you know point of view and i think this is dangerous so just because it is shared by your closest people and not just by this one mysterious authoritative <laughs> editor of a newspaper you still have to check so it's about overcoming your you know laziness basically and just checking Okay, uh, Yanis, what's, what's uh, your opinion on Hello? instruments to get away from disinformation in everyday life? Well, I mean, I can't say better than, than Nelly did, basically, don't be lazy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and actually, I, I can just add sort of an example of this, right? So nowadays, we're all so aware about what we eat, you know, and I've seen people in the shops checking uh, the labels of, of, um, of products, where they come from, and they have all these bio, bio stands, we go and buy food there. So we all have organic, you know, it's all this. But I mean, but this is the, the same. And also, I mean, also personally, I mean, we take showers and then and, and we, I mean, we, we take bath, right? So we take care of our hygiene. The same is this. Information is the same. I mean, please take care. I and mean, this is what, what Elena said. Take care and don't be lazy. I mean, this is like, you know, not cutting your nails like, like that. <laughs> it is it is disgusting, actually. People who don't 
don't invest just a bit of time. I mean, in this, in this, where it's coming from. It's also disrespectful to other people. I mean, you are part of information fields. It's like you can't just, you know, go around sharing stuff you don't know. I mean, please do this. And there's one rule of thumb I can just, just, just tell you. So this information actually works on our emotions and it's find often finds the darkest of them, you know, like the fears, you know, and all those things. So one of rule, rule of thumb would be this. If sometimes you see suddenly something on your social media feeds, either it's the old one like Facebook or the new ones, trendy ones, and it, it grabs you, you know, and like have this strong emotional feedback loop. You want to like do something like this, like take a pause, really. Just, just relax, take a pause and think about this. So because it might be actually targeted towards you and it's targeted towards emotions. So don't do stupid mistakes, you know, like don't get in a, in a fight in the bar. Think before you do this. So that's my recommendation. Think twice, yes, and don't be lazy. <laughs> okay, we have, it means the two solutions. Don't be lazy and, and think. Uh, if I'm, well, deciding to think and not to be lazy starting from tomorrow, because today it's afternoon already, <laughs> I'm going to start tomorrow. So what would be, what's, what's your routine? What's your routine when you are at the morning time, uh, the morning coffee, opening up the social media? What's your routine not to becoming a part of this information, Elena? Yeah, actually, um, I've had certain uh, cases, uh, just as I described a minute ago, where uh, I have uh, people who are very well educated, uh, you know, work in uh, media or government institutions, and they've actually shared uh, this information unwillingly uh, because they've picked it up from their peers. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to fall for it. Uh, so usually, exactly as Jan has said, if this seems a bit, you know, sensational or uh, appealing to something, so encouraging for an action or decision uh, on my part, uh, or me taking sides, uh, I always uh, try to search for it to see who's actually written about it, who else has published about it. And uh, at the end of the day, I try to go to the original source that is, that is being talked about. So a very good lesson I learned, for example, uh, about uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, so, for example, uh, it became extremely popular to distribute these, you know, one minute or two minute uh, videos about his press conferences with other foreign leaders, uh, where, to be honest, uh, he looked just awful, like a crazy person. And uh, I was thinking, hmm, this is really sad. But then I learned to actually, you know, find the time and actually sit and watch all 40 minutes. And what I discovered was that, in fact, you know, all of us, probably if you cut up my, you know, <laughs> interventions here, you could also make me look like a crazy person. Uh, but, you know, that was the point that, you know, of course, he maybe made some e eccentric move or something. But the point is that if you cut all that in two minute video, you know, you really give a completely wrong impression or different impression about what was going on. And if you watch the full 40 minutes, it's actually fine because these little moments are distributed across 40 minutes and a lot of them are actually in a context. So this is important to go to the original source and actually look and make your own judgment and not just fall for some impression that somebody else is trying to create for you. Which means investing your time. Time, yes, in precisely. Work with the information. Yeah. Yanis, uh, uh, could you share your personal routines of uh, of uh, everyday work with information on the very personal level? Uh, well, I mean, so one one thing I do, and I think most of us do, be I try to consume sort of different different sources of media, and I try to then sort of because I mean, as we know, uh, media so also the best media and the, and the independent media. So uh, they, they all journalists are humans. They come from a place. So we always try to put that in perspective. So and then see how basically what the interpretation of those things are. So that that's always helps me. And if and actually if I uh, look at what some event from different perspectives, it's always you know you always try to to, to find the balance between those views to to take to define your own opinion and where you stand on this. But I wonder if it's about tips and routines. I want to share uh, one tip uh, for for those of us who want to quickly find, basically to check if this is this information or not, or on, for, for example, on social media. So uh, I do two things. So, so for, as, as Elena told you, so uh, people uh, don't become experts, you know, uh, out of nowhere. So in other words, if there's somebody who's sharing information about economics, 
COVID, uh, future, past, 5G, they can't know all this, right? And how would you know this? People specialize years in these topics to be able to be experts. So the, it means these people actually take information from somewhere. So the question is, from where? And this is, and they often, what they do, they often uh, take this and they translate this from other languages and they sort of merge different topics and add their own things. And then they post it as, as this, this interesting, interesting in, uh, post. So what I do, I mean, to find out where it comes from, I go for the, for the numbers and for the lists of names, for example. So if, if, the, if for example, if there's an argument that, um, that I mean, this old story that uh, Latvia uh, was better off during Soviet times, and they often use some kind of numbers, millions, billions of rubles, you know, what big Latvia gained or lost. So I would take these billions of rubles, you know, and, and actually search for that in Russian. This could actually bring me to the to the to the article. Also, what I do is lists. So sometimes the, in these posts, you say they, they say, yeah, this expert, that expert, and basically, and they give a name of some some random other experts. But that list, they would not change the sequence of them. So you just take the list, uh, transfer this, to, for example, Cyrillic, and do the search. And the images, uh, often people are lazy. Uh, the, so they would use the same image of that. So I would uh, sort of, this is my tip, basically. If you want to have a quick, uh, quick thing to understand where this guy or this, or when this person, where they get information from, go for numbers and lists. Those actually will take you to the, to the source. And use Google. Ah, it's an amazing tool we'll have. <laughs> Use Google, amazing tool. Uh, we are living in democracy, and uh, and uh, we have also wonderful rights to put the pressure on decision makers and ask for decision makers to do kind of actions. Uh, what is considering this information the thing we should ask from the state, and what decision makers should be concerned about, Elena? Yeah, I think uh, this is another point where we have to overcome our laziness is that we have to be involved in this debate uh, and actually come up with these, you know, suggestions or demands uh, on how the state could handle it. But I think that um, really it is about the fine line that we are walking between the, you know, limiting freedom of speech uh, and, you know, uh, making our information environment safe. Uh, and, you know, this again is another one million dollar question, uh, you know, where this fine line is, because we may refer to such concepts as, you know, uh, hate speech, uh, inciting violence or hatred towards certain groups. You may say, oh, but that's very clear, you know, so if this disinformation uh, uh, is, you know, kind of related to hate speech, we just block it, we just persecute people. But it's not so easy because uh, all these, uh, you know, notions, these concepts, they are quite fuzzy, I would say. And, uh, you know, uh, it is widely recognized that this is the case and this is why it's so difficult. And this is why this is the area that is, you know, being abused constantly. Also, you know, um, uh, for example, one good step that we have is GDPR so the mm. protection of our user data so that we are less likely to become uh, targets uh, of disinformation so okay that was not the only purpose why it was invented but I think uh, this uh, kind of wave of disinformation that we've experienced certainly became one of the key motivators why this GDPR uh, wa regulation was actually um, you know uh, accepted so I think you know thank you European Union because uh, I think now really without the access to all my data, I, I feel more secure because I'm not uh, such an obvious target anymore necessarily. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, there is no magic bullet. And I, and I will repeat that there is this very fine line that we have to walk between, you know, limiting freedom of speech and actually securing our information space. Uh, Yanis, uh, what could you add to this? Uh, what, uh, for instance, a student of 21st century, what he would be able to put the pressure on the decision makers and waiting from the politicians in this side. Thank you. It's kind of personal to me because I guess if the pressure is put on on the politicians, for example, Latvia, it will come to it will come on my agenda in the EU. So I have to be really careful what I tell here because otherwise I will have more work. But yes, I'm not afraid of more work. And uh, so, my, so the two things I would say that uh, I mean. Governments like government of Latvia and and the Baltics in general, uh, who have more experience with uh, with this information in the past, actually are quite active in the in a, in the EU's arena, also NATO arena, about uh, these topics, and they're really pushing for pushing forward 
for the for initiatives like like working with mobile platforms and getting more them more responsible and uh, and to actually to reacting to to foreign actors who are disinforming so i would say that that perspective is uh, things are happening well and especially from from our side i think that's good but what i would basically uh, i would uh, i would uh, add, agree to elena saying that we need sort of this this monitoring and detection is still still there being being developed and and if we could get some some smart some some smart brains on it and how to automate more the 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 monitoring i mean to be able to take this information because it's it hits us really bad when it spreads too wide so i have to we have to limit it as a start and second is the task i'm i'm daily involved and then some i could ask help is how to uh, how to educate people around us uh, including i mean our peers and our parents you know and grandparents who some of some of some of whom have joined the internet recently so how to work with them and uh, and maybe some interesting tools and also uh, some so some solutions for that but then also i can i can ask personally i mean all the I mean, you know the young people here or whatever age is is here in this this now discussion is that to spend some time, not only to take care of, of your social media feed, but also spend some time with your aunt, with your with your mom, with your grandma. I mean, sit there next to them with on uh, on an internet and and then like tell tell them something. Just don't go. I mean, and I was like, oh, she again shared a picture of me, you know, when I was a kid. Well, talk to them, explain them. I mean, how you when what is the internet, the privacy things. Tell about this information. Work with them. And then when it comes to the big solutions, if you are an IT T thinker. Those things think. I mean, also uh, EU EU is offering also support to these uh, these projects. We have this. Uh, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go do advertising for the EU. But the point is, uh, we need new thinking in detection, and we need your help, your human help, with dealing with people around you. Wonderful. Thank you, Yanis. You opened up, in fact, the final remarks uh, I want to discuss here, which is uh, what we can do extra if we, we feel comfortable in information era and we can identify and recognize this information. Yanis already told, speak with your aunt, uh, but what's, what's extra moves you can do to make this society better? No, I think it's all about uh, exactly engaging with other people, helping them. I think Janis pointed out very important thing about the older generation because a lot of the time they fall victim to disinformation because they don't know how to use internet and also because they don't know the language. So, you know, we can translate for them, but maybe this is also some innovative tool that could be presented because they, they you know, if you talk about Russian disinformation, if they want to Google it, they still Google it either in the native language or in Russian. They don't go to English language sources etc so I think there are a lot of little things that we can do but it is about you know helping each other and educating each other either through the system or you know peer-to-peer -peer. wonderful uh, at this particular moment uh, I see Eddie is already back here which means the time is over I want to say extremely thank you to Yanis Rungulis strategic communications European external action service thank you Yanis Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and Eli Nalange, Jonathan Mishvili, Senior Expert of NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. Thank you, Elina. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for pronouncing my surname correctly. Oh, well yes. done. <laughs> <Thank> oh. <you>. <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, uh, this was uh, very good. Thank you very much for this. And uh, I mean, in this uh, era of online conferences, uh, we don't hear a lot of applause, right? So, y I mean... I, I, I'll do whatever <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> <because> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.